friends, welcome to our illustrious panel discussion. It's exploring eBPF use cases in cloud native security. So let's start with inter introductions. Everyone introduce yourself, please, and make sure to brag a lot because we're establishing trust. Why do we care what you have to say? Maya, do you want to start? Sure, that sounds good. Hi, everyone. My name is Maya Singh. I am a product manager at Microsoft. And at Microsoft, I work on the Inspector Gadget project, which if you were here earlier, Ben and Dor uh, gave a shout out to, so that was awesome. Um, Inspector Gadget, for those of you who don't know, is a tool and framework for data collection and systems inspection on Kubernetes and Linux and uses eBPF. Great. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Courtney Nickerson. Uh, I am a senior developer advocate at Kube Shop. I work on the TestCube project. TestCube is an open source orchestration and execution framework for your testing environments. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Kapuscinska. I work at Isovalent. I'm a software engineer working on mainly on Tetragon, which is um, project using eBPF for security observability and enforcement. Hi, um, I'd like to say good morning, but you're probably thinking about lunch. Um, my name is uh, Oshat Nir. Um, I am uh, the developer advocate at Armo, developer advocate for Armo and Cubescape. Um, we use eBPF both in Armo and in Cubescape for um, runtime security or uh, cloud and application detect and response, um, both in Cubescape and in runtime. Amazing. And I'm Whitney Lee. I'm moderating today. I'm a CNCF ambassador, a KubeCon keynote speaker, Platform Day keynote speaker. I host some shows, I podcast, whatever. I'm me. Um, so I'm so excited to explore these eBPF use cases in security, and it's kind of a big topic. So we had a little bit of discussion about where to start, but we're going to dig in first with network security. How can eBPF be used to enhance network security in, uh, in Kubernetes? Maya, will you start, please? Sure. Thanks, Whitney. So when we're thinking about eBPF and cloud-native network security, what comes to mind oftentimes is using eBPF for filtering and managing network traffic, and that can take uh, the form of firewalls, for example. So how this works is eBPF programs are event-driven, so they are executed when they run past hooks, and we can use network hooks that will uh, trigger the eBPF program, and we can filter network packets based on certain criteria, like IP address sources and destinations. And this allows us to build some rules, build some firewall uh, capabilities using eBPF. And if you're new to eBPF and interested in getting into building your own firewall, XDP, which is Express Data Path, is a good tool that you can use to get started with using eBPF for firewalls. In particular, um, what's cool about XDP is it actually um, hooks in at the uh, network interface control uh, driver part of the uh, stack, so that is actually the earliest point where we can filter uh, packets, and that results in a very efficient and performant way to build these firewalls and uh, execute the eBPF programs. So um, yeah, all that said, uh, eBPF is a very uh, good tool when it comes to networking security, um, definitely. eBPF for firewalls, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Osha, do you have something to add? Yeah, um, this is a little bit about, um, I guess, the crossover between runtime security and uh, posture management. So basically, if you, you can use eBPF to understand your application. Uh, again, if you were here before, then uh, you know that uh, devs don't really um, get SecOM profiles. They don't really pay attention to what their application needs in terms of networking either. 
Uh, however, uh, what we can do is use EPPF to understand what these applications need and leave only that open. Well, whereas uh, <clears throat> creating, um, uh, creating an automation of how to create um, network security profiles or um, and, and then close down what's not necessary and just leave only the necessary things open. So we use runtime to inform posture. So the, the people, security people, often don't understand what an application's actually doing. And eBPF can help give security folks that visibility, and therefore they can do better security. Correct. That's awesome. So that's network, how it can help out the network layer. How can eBPF help with runtime security? Anna, we start with this one. Uh, sure. So oh, there's so much, really, we can do <laughs> with, for, for runtime security with eBPF. Um, Tetragon project uh, uses eBPF for two main aspects of uh, runtime security, observability and enforcement. And using eBPF means that we can hook into any point in Linux kernel, what is incredibly powerful and very flexible in case we want, for example, uh, detect uh, CVE uh, exploits. So we, over the past few years, we went through this exercise several times. Whenever there is a high severity announced and it's like on the front page of all the newspapers, we very quickly find an appropriate hook point in the Linux kernel and we attach to it, we publish and document a policy we can have it like within an hour, and then security engineers can just take its policy, apply to their um, systems without reinstalling anything, without restarting anything, with minimal overhead, because everything runs in kernel, so the overhead is minimal, so security engineers can just take this policy and apply it, uh, not worrying really about any side effects. And uh, circling back to network security, uh, we can hook into a Linux networking stack. Um, so can I can I restate what you just said to make sure. sure I understood correctly? So what you're saying is when there's a new vulnerability, we can now mitigate that vulnerability instead of needing to find yes. it everywhere in all the applications and all the dependencies. We can fix it at the kernel level. Is that what you just said? Yes. Wow. This is this is this is what we can do with that enforcement piece. Um, so for a network. Uh, security use cases, we can hook into Linux networking stack, we can do things like um, capture bytes sent between applications into external destinations, so uh, detect things like data expectation, detect suspicious connections to external destinations, um, to unknown URLs, for example, and uh, process um, visibility is uh, another big one. So this is kind of the basic use case for, for Tetragon that many Tetragon users start with. Uh, monitoring suspicious processes, things like uh, privileged processes, privileged escalations, many different ways oh. of escalating privileges. Um, late process execution. So in Kubernetes world, we usually expect a um, process start together with a pod if another process associated with this pod starts a long time after, after the pod has started. This might be suspicious, this might be an attacker, so we can detect things like this. Um, we can monitor file operations, uh, such like um, edits to sensitive files. And then there's an enforcement piece. Uh, so doing enforcement in VPF is, to put it very simply, more secure. Uh, than doing a similar thing in user space, because we can actually block the low level operation before kernel completes it. If we tried to do something similar in user space, then we would have to either assume something, how application executed this operation, um, or we would have to revert an operation that is already completed by the kernel. Uh, so for example, if we want to enforce, uh, protect sensitive files, so enforce that only allowed uh, applications can edit a file, for example, a password, then when we, we hook into kernel function that is executed on every file modification, and we don't allow it to complete the operation. So we, for example, overwrite the return value of the function, and we send a, a SQL signal to 
basically the process that is trying to modify. So unlike how it used to be where something bad would happen and then you'd get an alert and then you'd stop it, now that bad thing can't even happen. It's, it's prevented yes. from happening at all. Yes, exactly. That's cool. And we, we do it directly in the kernel so an attacker can't really find you know, a way around it because you know there are many different ways to edit a file. Like you might be surprised how you know, how many <laughs> different ways applications can do it. So yeah, doing it directly in a kernel, we we are just making it more secure. When you say monitor uh, suspicious activity, are you saying mm, so like uh, escalation, like privilege escalation? You're not saying no, people can't do it. You can do something that says if this is happening, we're going to start capturing more data. What? Yeah. yeah, so we can, uh, we can do two things, essentially. We can first audit uh, who is doing the, who is, what processes run with high privileges. Um, and then we can also uh, just list, allow list only processes that we know are allowed to run with high privileges because usually we need, right? We need some processes to read sensitive files, to run with high privileges, but usually it's a small number of applications that we know and we can just block anything else. Amazing. Courtney, would you like to add about runtime security? I mean, what Anna just said is absolutely robust and spectacular. And <laughs> she talked about almost everything you can do in runtime security uh, with eBPF. I think the biggest thing to highlight here and, and what Anna was really saying is the paradigm shift that's happened because eBPF is running from the kernel. It's such a lightweight way of doing runtime security. It's so much more efficient that you're actually seeing a huge number of applications that using traditional ways of, of running your runtime security just aren't possible. So a lot of people are still using a traditional method of having a combination of tools where you've got something that's running some scans in combination with some agents that are deployed. You have all of those things that you have to maintain. It introduces a huge amount of latency into your system. It can also introduce possible vulnerabilities and other issues that you're going to have to deal with, um, as well as consuming huge amounts of resources, which is something that none of us want to be consuming huge amounts of in the cloud space. Um, uh, but in using eBPF as such a lightweight way of, of doing your runtime security, you're really um, going to reap all of the benefits that Anna has already talked about, um, as well as, as lower a lot of your overhead and, and complications that, that traditional methods um, are still, still causing people. Amazing. Osha, what would you like to add? Um, I'd like to add that you know some of the things that we do when we're uh, when we define runtime security rules is we make assumptions. Um, I used to be told about when you make, you assume you make uh, out of you and me, but whatever. <laughs> um, but my point is is, is that. Um, we make assumptions, we might get caught up in tunnel vision, we might get caught up in other problems. We might not to be thinking outside the box, especially specifically now. Uh, the thing is, is that the hackers or the potential hackers or malicious actors, they do think outside the box because I think that's just the way they do their job, so to speak. Um, so my point is, is um, when uh, you use eBPF in order to benchmark normal application activity and you know what is ordinary, what is allowed, what is okay. Anna mentioned that you know file systems are opened uh, in many, many ways. Um, um, uh, and sometimes an application needs privileged access and sometimes it doesn't. And all of this stuff, when you have to think about it manually or you, know, you don't think manually, but you get my point. When you have to think about all of these situations and implement them, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, another thing that you can do is use eBPF in order to benchmark this normal activity. And then when it, during runtime, you are still using eBPF in order to monitor what's actually going on. And when eBPF kind of sees something that's out of the, out of the ordinary, then it can alert or it can respond by you know, either you know, quarantining a process, uh, killing a process, allowing for graceful shutdown. There are many, many options. But, um, but again, this allows you that flexibility of not having to think of every single thing that could wrong, go wrong, because that makes for sad people. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, a more zero trust approach where you maybe 
don't do anything unless you understand what, what is expected and then define everything based on what's Correct. expected and say no to everything else. Um, I think that's a good mental, like mental model in real life. That's how I do my to-do list. Just pick one important thing. Don't worry about all the possible things. Um, so one thing that you all kind of touched on that I was curious about is, so you've convinced me EBPF is extremely powerful. And I always think like with great power comes great responsibility, right? Like how, if this incredibly powerful technology fell into the hands of the wrong person, it could have uh, disastrous results. So what measures are being taken to make sure that these tools, uh, eBPF access, kernel access, doesn't fall into the wrong hands? Uh, Anna, do you want to start this one? Um, sure. So the first thing that we can, or maybe we should do, is restrict who is able to load BPF programs into the kernel, right? Um, so and when you say who, do you mean people or programs, or both? Programs, yeah. programs in general okay. programs. And then, you know, access to this program's configuration is another thing, like <laughs> who, who, people, uh, who people can configure them. Um, so one thing we could do is to hook, um, surprise, surprise, we can do this with eBPF too. Uh, we can hook into BPF Cisco that is responsible for loading BPF programs. Oh. But actually, Cisco's are sometimes problematic in security context. Uh, so what we prefer doing uh, using Tetragon is to hook into eBPF Verifier. So eBPF Verifier is a component that um, Run a kernel component that verifies that BPF programs are safe to run. And EPPF verifier is specific to Tetragon, or it's a it's, no. it's eBPF. It's BPF. Okay, it's got it. Component in the Linux kernel um, that is run every time that BPF programs is loaded, and uh, we can hook into it, uh, like to any other hook point in in the kernel, and we can check if the program that is loading BPF programs or maps is in, in allow listed in the policy. Um, so yeah, then we can also audit what exactly, what programs and maps it uh, loads exactly. And so you do, how often do you manipulate eBPF directly and how much are you using eBPF tools to manipulate the Linux kernel? Um, so typically you, um, you Typically, you have a user space agent that loads all these BPF programs, right? Mm -hmm. So this, uh, is, this is done only on the startup of BPF agents. Um, but then you can load some um, extra policies. So policies are typically loaded dynamically. So you know, it, it depends how often security engineers are changing their policies. OK. Uh, and then also, this, there is like, um, so the power of BPF is that we can share some data between application and a kernel. So we can, for example, pass Kubernetes metadata or um, some other application level things to BPF maps. So this is another point of like, interaction. Cool. Maya, would you like to add about how we can keep it safe? Yeah, definitely. I think um, your earlier question was a good one around like, Many times, folks aren't writing their own eBPF programs. We're using uh -huh. eBPF programs written by others. And naturally, when you're thinking about, oh, uh, I want to make sure my program's coming from a trusted source, we're thinking about signing the programs and this, uh, checking the signatures of the programs. But with eBPF programs in particular, it's a little tricky because the programs undergo some changes before being loaded into the kernel. So I am really excited excited about what the Inspector Gadget project is doing. We have our eBPF programs housed in OCI images. These are the gadgets that correspond to Inspector Gadget. And we use Cosign to sign these uh, OCI images so that when you are running the gadgets at runtime, we're checking to make sure the signature is there and valid so that you can trust that the eBPF program that you're running is verified and legitimate so that as you're thinking about making sure your system is safe, um, you want to make sure that the eBPF program is coming from a legitimate source. So checking that um, key is a great way. I think that's like a good uh, 
mechanism that's in place to make security a little bit easier for these uh, eBPF programs. That makes so much sense. Is that common practice with the other tools too, or are you pioneering that? I am not sure if other tools house the eBPF programs in OCI images and have the same gadget framework, but the good thing about Inspector Gadget is you can build your own gadget, so please uh, put your eBPF programs inside gadgets and oh. use that assigning functionality, because it's, it's an advantage outside of the, even, you know, the enrichment with Inspector Gadget and all, all of Kubernetes containers, all of that good stuff. Also, the security of the images and the eBPF programs is a huge plus as well. It provides a framework for writing your own eBPF program so that you don't have to worry about it from the ground up. Yeah, exactly. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Yep. So another thing eBPF makes me think about is, is we're talking about, between network and runtime security, we're talking about monitoring all of the, everything that comes through the kernel, which sounds like a tremendous amount of information. And it sounds, um, it sounds bad for performance. It sounds expensive. So how could, let's talk about cost. Like what should an organization do to maximize security and minimize cost? Let's start with Courtney on this one. Yeah, um, I actually talked with Duffy Cooley about this in preparation for this event uh, to give more context around this. And what he explained to me was that a lot of times people do think that getting started with eBPF is going to be far more expensive, mostly because of the monitoring aspect and that you can monitor everything. Um, but that it's actually far from the reality. The expense can actually reduce drastically uh, implementing eBPF because it is running from the kernel. Very first thing starting, starting off from the beginning is that you're not using anywhere near as much CPU or memory. Your resources are, are drastically re reduced in terms of um, running eBPF because it's running at the kernel level. It's not running on other, on other Kubernetes resources. Uh, in doing that, it also reduces the amount of resources you need for loads of other things. And so turns out um, while you can monitor everything, a, and maybe you want to do so or maybe you don't, the concept of having that many things to monitor, um, you can actually reduce the, the amount of expense that you have in doing so by, by implementing eBPF instead of other tools. So I think that's something, especially for people who might be intimidated with the technology aspect of getting started. Um, there's so many resources out there to get started, but also the, the long-term implementation, because it's also a way to be far more proactive in, in your runtime security, for example, you can then actively be monitoring things and stop certain events from happening uh, proactively, which are then going to cause fixes to happen much earlier on that's going to save you a lot more time and money. So there are a lot of different aspects of once you actually get started with eBPF that, that are going to save you huge amounts of, of money um, and resources on the backside. Cool. Osha, do you have any comments about cost? I, I, I wrote a note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I was sure I, was, I, I would fudge the numbers, and I wanted to be, keep it real here. Oh, some statistics. I love it. So, so, so basically, um, I'm talking here from the point of view of Cubescape at the moment, because uh, Cubescape is a tool that uses eBPF via Inspector Gadget, by the way. Um, so we, uh, we were very... Um, um, Cognizant, or try to be really, really aware of keeping um, of keep resource consumption very, very low, because we know that um, that that can be a very painful point when it comes to cloud. Um, so um, we tested on a specific, you know, not all nodes were created equal. Okay, so uh, this changes between environments, but um, but we tested this out and we found an average of um, one percent to two and a half percent of CPU um, uh, usage and uh, about one percent of RAM per node. Um, so again, these are really small numbers, maybe even negligent, um, and, and that's the idea, keeping it really, really uh, small, lightweight, uh, actually using that idea of EPPF, of it being both uh, safe and lightweight in order to not pass the buck on to uh, users um, that will consider this the cost of doing business. It doesn't have to be. If, can you have more than one program, like if you're collecting all of the, if you're monitoring all the processes on a node, can more than one program use that monitoring information or is that monitoring happening in a double way? 
Does that make sense? If Tetragon's monitoring every single process on a node and Inspector Gadget's monitoring every process on a node, is every process being monitored twice? Um, essentially, if you have two different eBPF-based tools that like, you know, want to monitor every process, then uh, yeah, essentially, if they like, don't share BPF programs, or BPF maps, then every process would be monitored twice. Uh -huh. uh, this is something you know to work on in the BPF community. <laughs> I'm totally uh, going off script. Yeah, too, I know yeah. many, many <laughs> they people. did not know I was going to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> many people are concerned about you know running thousands of agents that are doing some EPF stuff and that are monitoring same things. Uh, so this is definitely something that you know, we should work on as as community to to kind of. Work, work together and avoid like having million tools doing the same thing. Excellent. Is there anything else you'd like to say on the on the cost piece and the performance piece? Um, yeah. So um, if uh, once when we are uh, monitoring, hooking to different points in the kernel, um, one thing that uh, we definitely want to avoid, like. You know, emitting events on every single thing that that happens in the kernel, and even if we do this, even if we like emit events on every single thing, then what do you do with these events, right? Yeah. Like, a human can't just you know process constant stream of everything that's happening. We need to somehow filter these events, aggregate them, somehow process them to actually find interesting things there. And this is typically done by some user space data processing. A lot of things that we actually do with BPF is simply moving what we typically do, like data processing that we typically do in user space, to the kernel. So we filter in the kernel. We don't, for example, monitor every single fire operation. We emit events only on uh, op operations that seem suspicious. Um, we aggregate in kernel. So this is particularly important for network events when we, you know, we don't want to emit every single, um, how many bytes were sent on every single message, but rather aggregate uh, these byte counters in the kernel. Um, things like that. Parsing layer 7 protocols is another thing that is typically done in user space, but we actually can, uh, we wrote DNS parser in BPF, uh -huh. so um, parsing uh, DNS names and you know, external URLs can be done in kernel too. So in this way, we are actually uh, reducing the overhead So because we, instead of doing expensive data processing um, in user space after producing all of these events, we can actually filter, aggregate, process directly in the kernel. So we alert users only on uh, suspicious, interesting, or otherwise important statistics. So if you were trying to do that without BPF, eBPF, then you're going to save a lot of performance time and money. Yeah, if, if you can uh, you can do a lot of these things like without eBPF, uh, just collecting events in, uh, and processing them in user space, but uh, doing this directly in BPF actually you know, reduces the overhead a lot. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so don't look at how much it takes, but look at how much it can save, right? <laughs> I'm right. looking at it from the wrong side. <laughs> so uh, what what personas should be interested in eBPF, Oshrat? OK, so now we're going back to the age-old conversation of um, DevOps, uh, developers, operators, security, DevSecOps, uh, shifting left, and all of that. Um, the crux of the thing is is developers build programs. They build applications that do whatever it is that they need to do. They do this without or with minimal security awareness, even, um, even post the shift left revolution. Uh, I mean, we've all shifted left, and that's great, and we're doing a great job. Uh, and still, there are holes, and still security can be tightened. On the other hand, we've got um, the security engineers. We've got the SecOps people. Um, they have a goal. And that goal is to secure things. And then there's the business. The business wants things to work securely because they, they don't want a security event because that costs a lot of money. But they don't want the applications to break either because that, too, costs a lot of money. So what we have here is um, two sets of um, uh, professionals that don't speak the same language. Um, what using uh, tools that, uh, that implement eBPF, uh, what using eBPF can do 
is to highlight and the, the gaps and then make it very, very clear what needs to be fixed. And if we take that even one step further, we can talk about um, even automating things that can help uh, tighten security based on runtime information. And this goes back to the first question where we were talking about network policies. We can use eBPF that has learned what the application needs without talking to the developer and can suggest automatically uh, which um, um, network policies should be implemented um, so that the security engineers can do that without breaking the application. And then we have met all the goals of everybody. Nice. Courtney. <laughs> If eBPF is so awesome, why is security still so hard? <laughs> oh, God. <sighs> OK, uh, thanks for giving me the hard one. <laughs> um, I think there are a lot of reasons I think that security is still so hard. And I think I'll pretty piggyback a little bit off of what Oshra was saying in terms of who should be uh, thinking about eBPF and interested in it. And she very much is speaking to these personas that speak different languages. And not only are they speaking different languages, they have different contexts around security, what it means to them, what it means to their day-to-day -day, uh, jobs, what it means to the company. All of these cultural aspects play just as big of a role as the technical aspects do, right? Um, I'll let my colleagues who are here, my co-panelists speak to, to the technical aspects, but I think a lot of times we overlook how complicated the cultural aspects are. And so when you're dealing with siloed teams that have different ideas about how things should work or what should be going on, or you get a lot of pushback, because a lot of people think that putting more security is actually going to take away from the opportunity for innovation and slow things down. Um, all of a sudden, you're, you're already up against a, a mountain trying to get something new implemented. And I think eBPF is one of these things that can actually bridge the gap between devs who might not be security-minded security or oriented and the security team or the ops team because it provides a lot of monitoring and visibility and transparency around the different aspects of what's going on, not just at the kernel level, but at the application level, at the infrastructure level. And all of a sudden, that uh, visibility actually makes it a lot easier for people to have more confidence context and understand uh, why security should be implemented and, and be more willing to get on board with it. Awesome. Thank you. Anna, what's the hard part of using eBPF for security? Oh, I 100% agree with what Courtney just said, that uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the cultural organizational part is and split between different teams. Um, it, it's hard part, more often than not. Uh, eBPF, um, can actually help with this, uh, the fact that we can uh, pass uh, like high level application level data, for example, Kubernetes metadata, so something that application developers can understand into the kernel, and we can like um, monitor things inside the kernel, but filter aggregate by this application metadata, this is great. Um, from the technical perspective, what, uh, in my experience, is hard uh, when using KVP for security is finding right hook points is really hard because uh -huh. we need to find right hook point that is executed um, like every, every time something happens so that an attacker can't find some workaround, just a different way of doing a thing. If we want to enforce, uh, we need to find a reliable way to actually block this operation. And uh, this requires just reading kernel code, understanding exactly what kernel does um, mm -hmm. on particular operation, and finding uh, also a hook point that is you know, that works across different kernel versions and kernel distributions. So yeah, this, there's no magic in there. This is just, this requires just reading the code, <laughs> but it's a lot of code. And um, <laughs> it requires this time, certain expertise. So this is just difficult. Um, something that uh, Tetragon project has is policy library, where we have like, you know, policies, um, written by people who sit in this code many years um, that are uh, created to be secure and reliable, and also like many, many examples provided by the community, because you know, difficult things are 
difficult and they are there to be solved. Um, mm -hmm. But to, to do that reliably, we, we really need to come together as a community and kind of collaborate on our learnings, uh, for example, as in the form of like sharing policies. Amazing. Maya, would you like to close us out by talking about why eBPF security is hard? Yeah, definitely. I feel like it can manifest in so many different ways. Security vulnerabilities can just be really, really tricky to identify. But on the bright side, eBPF does give us visibility into things we have never had visibility into before in terms of that super granular kernel level data. So when I think about Inspector Gadget, I think about our trace open gadget, which lets you know when a file is open so you can easily set alerts if you know you don't want your file that has all your passwords in it. Anytime it's open, you can get visibility into that. Or trace exec lets you see when processes are executed, so you can look for any unfamiliar processes. So we've come a long way. It's amazing to see that we now have such like great visibility into the kernel. Um, it's still going to be hard, definitely, but it's really exciting to see what we can do now with eBPF. The first step to solving a problem is understanding the problem, right? So. Excellent. Well, that's time. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thanks for sharing your valuable attention. We'll see you at lunch. We're all very kind and nice. Please come ask us questions.